basically I want to make sure I record that proof in case you want to go back through the proof again. So I will do that and get that posted later on YouTube. I don't know why I forget all the time. All right. So let's talk about now about how we can find the angle between two vectors in a particular in a vector space. So the formula for the angle between two vectors is this one. And if you've seen vectors before in, say, Calc 3, you've probably seen this formula. The reason why the formula works now is because, remember, if I want to figure out theta, I'm going to need to be able to do the inverse cosine of both sides. If I want to have inverse cosine on the right-hand side, I need to make sure that this is always between negative 1 and 1, which it will be because we know that if I do the absolute value of the top now, it's always less than or equal to the product that's in the bottom. So this will always be a number between negative 1 and 1, so there's not going to be any issues with taking the inverse cosine, no matter what inner product space we have, which allows us to figure out angles between vectors a little bit more interestingly than if we had um, just doing vectors uh, normally if, uh, in a Euclidean sense. So let's do one of these more interesting examples. Let's say we look at set of continuous functions on the interval from negative 1 to 1, and we have this inner product defined as an integral. So let's see if we can find the angles between these, uh, the 1 and the x, and the angle between the 1 and the 3 quarters x squared. So to be able to figure out the angles, we will do the integral. So the angle between p of x and q of x All right, so when we do this, we need to do the we need to do the dot product of the two vectors with each other, the inner product with the vectors with each other, and then the magnitudes of each of the vectors individually. So let's do the inner product first. So that's the integral from negative one to one of just one times x, which is x dx. And we could go through, go through all of the work with the fundamental theorem of calculus, but if we just remember ge geometrically what this is going to look like, from negative 1 to 1, you're going to get a triangle above the x-axis on the right-hand side and a triangle below the x-axis on the left-hand side. Those two triangles are congruent to each other, and the integral is going to count this as positive and this as negative, so this integral is going to be 0. You could go through it. I have no, qual no issues with you being able to go through it. I'm just telling you that there's no reason to go through it. Because I, 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 algebraically, this is an odd function over an interval that's symmetric about the origin. So it's another way you can think about it if you like it algebraically rather than geometrically. All right. I don't need to worry about computing the denominator then. If the numerator here is 0, it doesn't matter as long as these aren't 0. We, have, we know that the cosine of theta has to be 0, so theta has to be 90 degrees, or pi over 2. All right, let's do the angle between the p of x and the q of x, or r of x, I mean. So, inner product again, we'll do the integral from negative 1 to 1, in this case, of the 3 fourths x squared. This one I will do by <laughs> fundamental theorem of calculus. It's going to be 1 quarter x cubed. So, this gives me a half. And now I need to do the magnitude of each of these. So I'll do the inner product of the poly each of the polynomials with themselves. So this one will be negative 1 to 1 of 1 dx, because I'm just taking the 1 times itself. That gives me 2. So that tells me that the length 
of p of x, the magnitude of p of x in this case is square root of 2. This one, if I do r of x with itself, that gives me negative 1 to 1 of 9 sixteenths x to the fourth. I did not pick a nice number here. That's okay. It happens. Let's see. This is what? 9 over 80? X to the fifth. Evaluated from negative 1 to 1. So that gives me 9 over 40. So that tells me that the magnitude of R of X will be 3 over 2 root 10. Sure it is. <laughs> All right, so just doing the integrals. I know I went through them quickly, but I'll, um, you can go back and check. Hopefully I did my work right. So the idea here, though, is that the cosine of theta then will be the inner product of the P and the R. So it'll be the one half on top. And then the product of the magnitudes on bottom. So you get square root of 2 times 3 over 2 root 10. And if I did all my work, if I'm doing the arithmetic correctly in my head, I think you get square root of 5 over 3. This, there's a square root of 2 in the 10, so that'll cancel. Make leave a square root of 5. Those 2's will cancel, and the square root of 5 will flip to the top. So I believe you get square root of 5 over 3. So your angle in this case will just be inverse cosine of root 5 over 3, whatever that turns out to be. I'm not going to bother flipping over to the calculator to figure out what angle that is. The whole point of this, though, was that with an, even with a non-standard, if you will, inner product, you can still define things like angle between vectors and lengths of vectors, whatever those things mean. Questions on that one at all? Okay. So, let's go back up to... The, the inner product with P and Q. And we were, those, that has a special relationship when those vectors are at 90 degrees or pi over 2. We were, typically, when we think about Euclidean vectors, we think of those as being perpendicular. There's not a real good geometric sense for quote-unquote perpendicular when we're talking about general vector spaces, but this orthogonality idea still is a nice thing to have. So we're going to make it as a definition. We say that the vectors are orthogonal if, when you take the inner product of the two vectors, you get zero. So that's our definition of orthogonal for vectors. So in a Euclidean sense, if you have orthogonal vectors, they're perpendicular. They meet at a right angle. In general, we still say the angle is 90 degrees, but in particular, we're interested in this dot product, this inner product being zero, because it has some nice special properties that we'll uh, elaborate more on here today and more throughout the rest of the week uh, with other processes as well. So let's see if we can do an example here where rather than checking whether or not a couple of vectors are orthogonal, let's look at finding values where they, uh, for a particular constant where they need to be orthogonal. So I didn't specify the space and I didn't specify the dot product here or the inner product here. Let's just assume that it, this is R3 because I have three dimensional vectors with the usual inner product. So no weird inner product here. We just do the product of each of the components and add them up. So if we want these two, or, two vectors to be orthogonal, that means when we take the inner product of the two vectors, we want to get 0. So the inner product, again, is just taking 
the product of each of the components and adding them together. So 3 times the k minus 4, a k times a k, and a negative 2 times a negative 7. We take the product of the individual components, add them together, get 0. If I simplify this, it looks like we get k squared plus 3k plus 2 is 0. And it looks like I, when I wrote this problem to start with, I rigged it correctly so it factored. Assuming I did my algebra to start with, okay. So we get k plus 1 times k plus 2, and so we get k is negative 1 or negative 2. But again, the idea here, not so much with solving the equation, because hopefully before this class you knew how to solve um, a polynomial equation like this. The idea behind this, of course, is just reinforcing the idea of what we mean by orthogonality. When you take the inner product of two vectors, you need to get zero. Um, one thing to notice, which probably don't think of this in a Euclidean sense, but notice that by the definition here, if I take the zero vector and take its inner product with anything, we already know from what we've done before that that inner product is always zero. Doesn't matter what this v is, so your zero vector is orthogonal by definition here to every vector in v. By the, de by the fact that we're using the inner product as the definition here, not as angle between the two vectors, necessarily. We're using the inner product here to say that we get orthogonal. So that gives us that the, the uh, zero vector is always orthogonal, no matter what, to any vector that we want. So that's a little bit different than what you typically think of in terms of perpendicularity. You don't really think of the zero vector being perpendicular to things, because it's a zero vector. It's just a dot, essentially in Euclidean space. Any questions on that example at all? Okay. So, let's talk about orthogonal complements. So, we're going to be talking about uh, subspaces of an inner product space and defining what we refer to as the orthogonal complement. So before I do that, let's think about a picture, and then I'll talk about what I mean by this. So let's just think about, now let's do R2 to start with, because that is a little bit easier to visualize. Now subspaces, well, there's, remember our subspaces, the dimension of the subspace has to be less than or equal to the dimension of the entire space. So the dimension of R2, of course, is 2. So your only choices for dimensions for subspaces are 0, 1, or 2. Well, the only subspace that has dimension 0 is the 0 vector. That's not very interesting. The only subspace that has dimension 2 is the entire space, which is also not very interesting. Those would be what we typically refer to as trivial subspaces, either the whole thing or the zero vector. That's Both of those are pretty trivial because I, there's not a lot of things going on. There's not a lot of uh, properties that I'd be interested in for the sub piece of it. If all I have is a single vector, which is the zero vector, that's not interesting. Or if I have the whole, set, the whole space itself, that's also not very interesting because I'm not looking at a property of a piece of it. So in R2, the quote unquote interesting subspaces will be the dimension one subspaces. Well, one dimension is just, in Euclidean space, is just a line. Okay? And another thing that we know from subspaces is that the zero vector always has to be a member of the subspace, no matter what. So one-dimensional subspaces in R2 are lines that go through the origin. So just as an example, let's say I had this line. Is my W. Okay. This would be a one-dimensional subspace <clears throat> of R2. Okay. 
All right. So I'm interested in orthogonal complement. Okay, so let's just think about what the words mean and then talk about what the definition is. Orthogonal, from a Euclidean sense, means perpendicular. Complement would mean basically it's the rest of the space. If you think about complements from a set theory idea, it needs to be the rest of the space. Now, in some sense, that's not really what, I mean, it is, is what's going on. But as far as the subspace goes, we have to be a little bit careful. What I mean by the rest of the space here is, I know that this space has dimension one, the way I have it drawn. I know that the dimension of R2 is two. So the rest of the space would have dimension one. That's what I mean by the rest of the space. There's vectors that are kind of left over. If there's a part of it that's, that uh, satisfies the axioms of being a subspace, the rest of the space is going to have dimension one. So I need the perpendicular piece that has dimension one. That's the orthogonal complement in this case. Orthogonal is perpendicular. Complement is the rest of the dimensions. So I want the subspace here perpendicular to W that has dimension one. Well, we just said that dimension one is a line and we know what perpendicularity looks like in R3, or R2 I mean. So we're talking about this subspace. That's the orthogonal complement. That was supposed to be a little perpendicular symbol that just now looks like a red blob there in the middle. This is your orthogonal complement, or how we write as W with a little perpendicular sign superscripted. And we actually say W perp rather than say orthogonal complement. That's seven syllables as opposed to, uh, well, as opposed to four. W perp versus orthogonal complement. It's a lot easier to say W perp. Okay. So this is what we mean by orthogonal complement. So it's in this case, so notice that we, we define it into, I wrote it as a dot product. I probably should have written it as a inner product here. So it's the set of everything in V that has an inner product of zero with everything in W. Okay, so in other words, W perp is the set of vectors that are orthogonal to everything in W. So notice right away that one thing that has to be in W perp is the zero vector, because we just said the zero vector is perpendicular to everything no matter what. So the zero vector will be in W perp automatically because it's, it's automatically orthogonal to everything. So notice that's what we mean over here by um, this idea. Let's see if I can change some colors here. Okay, so let's say here's a vector in W, this green one here. Here is a vector in W perp say it's along that line, we see that those two things are perpendicular to each other. Also with this, uh, let me change this one to red here. So also notice that if I take any other vector along W, this red one's still perpendicular to those, no matter what. Okay. So this, anything that's along this red line is perpendicular to anything that's along the black line, or what I've drawn in green pretty much here at this point. That's what we mean by orthogonal complement. Uh, to draw another picture, try to draw three dimensions. I'm very, very bad at it. Let's say we do R3. Let's just for argument's sake say my one dimensional subspace here is the y axis. This is my w. The dimension of my w is 1, again, because it's just a line. 
dimension of R3 has three, well, it's three. The dimension of R3 is three, which means the orthogonal complement, the rest of the space, must have dimension two and has to be perpendicular to everything in W. So my W perp must be here my XZ plane. Because anything that has a zero component for my y will be perpendicular to anything on the y-axis, which has a zero component for your x and your z. And again, you think about it, make, uh, the reason I think about it as the complement making up the rest of the space is from a dimension standpoint. The line had dimension one, this plane has dimension two. All right. I didn't want to scroll off that far in case you were still looking at it. Any questions about that idea at all before we go on and talk about how to define these things? All right. So let's show why we have to have a subspace here. So we already said that the zero vector is in W perp. So it's not empty. Let's start with two elements in the orthogonal complement. The definition of being in the orthogonal complement is that the vectors x and y are orthogonal to everything in W. And our definition of orthogonal is that the inner product is zero. So when I take the inner product of x with w, I get zero. When I take the inner product of y with w, I get zero. I want to show that x plus y and a constant times x are both back in w perp. The way I show membership into w perp is that I need to show it's the, the inner product with the, uh, anything in W is zero. Well, this is just a matter of playing with your axioms. We know that inner products distribute nicely over sums. X and Y are in W perp, so those inner products are zero. So we get zero. We also need to show that a constant multiple of a vector is back in the subspace again. So if I take the inner product of W with a K times an X, by again our properties with the inner product, the constant pulls out in front. And then these two things are true for all vectors in W. So therefore, The sum is back in there, and the scalar multiple is back in there. And this is exactly what we need to show to prove something is a subspace. Okay. So let's think about this part B real quick. So this says that I need a vector, something in W and something in W perp. That's what the intersection means. I already know that the zero vector is definitely in both of them. So I certainly have the right-hand side as a subset of the left-hand side. But if I have something, so let's suppose that I let something be in, I do call it X. If I let some vector be in the intersection, then in particular, that vector is in the orthogonal complement. 
is in W perp. And we just said the orthogonal complements the set of everything that's orthogonal to, to every, uh, it's the set of vectors that are orthogonal to everything in W. So this would mean that X is orthogonal to every vector in W, including itself, because X is also in W. Because it's in the intersection. All right? So this means that if I take x and take its inner product with itself, I have to get 0. That's what it means to be orthogonal to itself. And we know from properties of inner product that the only vector when you dot it with, or when you take its inner product with itself gives you 0 has to be the 0 vector. So that gives us that x had to be the 0 vector. Questions about either one of those proofs? Hearing none. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about how we find orthogonal complements. So the idea here is the following. So let's think about how you do multiplication in general. So if I look at the null space, remember the null space is the set of AX is equal to zero, right? That's how we find the null space. The null space are these X's. Well, I can think of my A as a bunch of row vectors. And I can think of my x as being a single column vector. And then I can, in R, in Rn, I can think, or Rm, I guess in this case, I can think of my uh, zero vector as a bunch of zeros. Now, when we do the product on the left-hand side, notice that you take row 1 and match it with the x and do essentially a dot product. So when you do that, you get, in the first component, you get R1 dotted with X. In the second component, you get R2 and you dot it with X. And all the way down, in the last component, you get RM and dotted with X. So notice that this says that if x is in the null space, then x dotted with r1 is 0, x dotted with r2 is 0, all the way down to x dotted with rm is 0. So this says that if, let's write this down, if x is in the null space, oops, then x is orthogonal to every row of A. So if X is in the null space, it's orthogonal to every row in A, which means that this implies that X is orthogonal to the row space, well, anything in the row space, write it this way, It's, at row, it's orthogonal to every vector in the row space. Remember, the row space is the set of linear combinations of the rows. Well, if X is orthogonal to every single row, it has to be orthogonal to, I wrote it as dot products. I should have wrote it as inner products, but we're going to leave it as dot products since we're doing RM. It's, if it's orthogonal to every single row, 
then it's orthogonal to every linear combination of the rows because remember inner products distribute over sums and constants pull out. So if it's, if it's orthogonal to each of the individual rows, it's orthogonal to any linear combination of the rows. So anything in the null space is orthogonal to anything in the, in the row space. So that already gives us that that the orthogonal complement of the row space is equal to the null space. So this gives you a way to find orthogonal complements in Rn. Okay. And notice this is in Rn because the rows are going across n columns here. So this is in Rn and we know that x is also in Rn to make the multiplication work. The other way is straightforward here. The reason why the null space of A transpose and the column space are A are orthogonal complements is because I know that the column space of A is the same as the row space of A transpose. So if I want the orthogonal complement of the column space, that's the orthogonal complement of the transpose of A, which is just the null space of A transpose by what we just talked about. <clears throat> so let's see if we can do an example of this because this is there's a lot more words here than it is really to actually do the problems, I promise. Okay, so let's do this example here. I want the orthogonal complement spanned by those three vectors. So I know that null space is orthogonal to row space. So what I want to do is I want to create a matrix that where I'm going to find the null space of the matrix so that I have an orthogonal complement to uh, uh, its null space will be its orthogonal complement to its row space. So the idea here then is I'm going to put these vectors in a matrix. We're used to doing that. However, for our purposes, instead of putting them in as columns, we're going to put them in as rows. Okay, and I need to put them in as rows because I need to find the null space of the matrix and the null space is orthogonal to the row space. So to make a row space, I've got to put the vectors in as rows. So we need to put these in and row reduce. And I don't think I have that done. So let's see if I can go over to the calculator here real quick. Of course, I'm going to have to switch back and forth because I don't remember what the matrix is. Oops, that was not the button I wanted to hit. Matrix. Edit A. It was 3 by 4. And one, four, five, two is the first row. So one, four, five, two. And the second row was two, one, three, zero. Two, one, three, zero. And the third row, negative one, three, two, two. So negative one, three, two, two. All right. So, we're going to row reduce that matrix. All right, so just to make it look a little bit prettier, let's change those to fractions. All right, so we get 1, 0, 1, negative 2 sevenths. So we had one zero one negative two sevenths, and if I can check zero one one four sevenths, and then 
a row of zeros. All right, so we can see that our x1 here will be, say, a negative s plus 2 sevenths t, and our x2 will be a negative s minus 4 sevenths t, x3 is s, and x4 is t. So that tells us that our solutions look like um, s times negative 1, negative 1, 1, 0, and t times 2 sevenths, negative 4 sevenths, 0, 1. So these two vectors would be in the null, uh, would be a basis for the orthogonal complement. So I could write them as columns, or excuse me, write them as rows then. So our W per will be the span of the vectors negative 1, negative 1, 1, 0, and by the way, you can use any constant multiple of this. This vector works just fine, but if you don't like the fractions, I can multiply everything by 7 and still doesn't change anything, still makes it a basis. Sometimes I like to do that just so I don't have to write the fractions down. But you can check that these really are, ortho each of these are orthogonal to all of the rows. Uh, for example, if I do the, the inner product, the dot product of the first one here with the first row, you see negative 1 plus negative 4 is negative 5, plus 5 is 0, plus 0 is 0. Or if um, I quick question. Yeah. How did you get the negative four seven? Uh, remember when you're doing the uh, null space, there's that imagined augmented zero on the right hand side. Uh -huh. So I'm oh, okay. I'm moving it over to the other side. Okay, okay. That makes sense. Yep. Okay. And then if I do this other one here, just to check it, to do, say, look at the second one with the second row. 2 times 2 is 4, negative 4 times 1 gives me negative 4, so that gives me 0, and then the other ones are going to be 0. So I really, you can go through and check the different products, and that we really do get um, a dot product of 0 there. Any other questions on that one? I know I had the homework due for Wednesday. I'm going to push it back to Friday because there's a couple of things that I want to talk about as well that I think go well along with the homework. And I just want you to get a little bit more time to absorb what we talked about today too. So if, if you're working on the homework and was planning on getting it done for Wednesday, that's great. But if you need a little bit of extra time, Friday is fine. I'm happy with that. Hopefully you're happy with that too. Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, any questions at all before we go? All right. Well, I will talk to you all later. Have a good one.